Hello, I'm Josh. I, uh, my name is Josh Broden. I'm from South Dakota, like he said, Sioux Falls to be exact. Um, I'm the interactive design lead for uh, Vistacom in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm also a front end developer. The reason I started putting that in my slides is because um, when people hear design lead, what they think is this, this dude in, well, Argyle, Argyle sweaters and, and big glasses who sits in a room and says yes or no to designs and maybe does a little Photoshop work himself, but that's the end of it. But at Vistacom, we don't have anybody like that. In fact, um, all of the front end development of everything that happens for our company is actually done by the designers. And so when I say I'm uh, a, an interactive design lead, really what that means is, I, is I'm the lead front end developer. I do some freelance work on the side for fun, uh, both design, front end development, and uh, user experience audits. Uh, I have finished my computer network security degree at DSU, just finishing up, wrapping up the second major in computer science. Uh, I got a website, joshbroton.com, and you can find me at, at twitter.com slash joshbroton. This here is, is the, uh, the warning I have to give at the beginning of every single one of my talk. I have moderate to severe adult ADD, and so I tend to get off the rails rather easily. So if, uh, if, I, if I do that, just wave your hands, jump up and down, leave. I mean, any of those will work, um, but just know that uh, I'm <laughs> doing my best. It's like a kid in a wheelchair. Don't make fun of me. All right. <laughs> my talk, I call it uh, Embrace Your Inner Designer because really one of the things that I have a hard time uh, communicating to people especially programmers, we've got uh, four or five programmers on staff, um, is that every, the choices that they make greatly affect the, the end result of what the user interface ends up looking like. And so uh, whether it's the classes they put on stuff, the way they nest divs, whatever it is, the choices that they make ultimately change the way that the final product looks. And so it's very important to understand how exactly important design is. Um, because there, it does actually three things for the user. One, it changes how the user uses your application. It changes how users see it. And then it changes how users spread your application. Those three things can be affected greatly just simply by the decisions that you make um, as a developer or in some cases as a designer. The first one is it changes the way that users see your application. In other words, it gives your application credibility. Yikes. Anybody ever seen a website like this? Yeah? This is a website that I ended up going to about four weeks ago because I needed a new part for a stove. And I landed on this site, and immediately I thought I had landed on an old GeoCities website from the late 1990s. <laughs> it's hideous. And, and I found the part that I wanted. It was like 28 bucks, and I was excited. But then it asked for my credit card information. And, and, and immediately I began to think to myself, do I really want to put my bank information on a form, on a website that looks like this. I've never heard of this company before. I don't know for sure if it's, a, it's a, a reasonable company or if it's a real company, not just a front. And so really what I felt like is I had landed here. And so I decided maybe that's not the best idea. So I jumped ship, I went to a different website. I ended up spending over double for the part that I needed, but I felt really good about giving them my banking information. So that's, that's one way that you can look at the, the final design decisions of your application, how, how it affects your users. But then there's companies like this, right? This is a fantastically designed, professional looking website. When I land on it, I'm excited, and I can't wait to give them my banking account information, my credit card number, my social security number, my firstborn child, whatever they want, they get. And the reason they get it is because it looks awesome and it looks good. So I, I'm more than willing to funnel every of my information into a website like this. The next one, the next thing that, that design does is it, it changes the way that your users use your application. And the way it does that, it, it makes using your application easier. And really when you're designing or when you're developing a website or an application, you have to stop thinking about screens. You have to stop thinking about the way it looks. And instead, you have to think about the way that it flows. So you should start thinking in flows, not in screens. You, what, what we do at Vistacom is we make a list of steps that we want the user to follow as they use our website or our application, our user interface. So rather than think about, OK, it would be really pretty if it looks this way, we think about, OK, this is how they're going to use it. And then we design around that. And the third important thing that you can do as a user or as a designer or developer, is to use your stuff yourself. Have you ever heard of the term dog fooding? It, I think it's one of the most important things that a company can do, is, is make the people who make the application use the application. Facebook's famous for this. About two months ago, they gave every single one of their programmers 
who work on their mobile products on an Android phone, and they said, you cannot go to Facebook.com, you cannot use your iPhones, you have to use our website or our application on your Android device so you can see how absolutely horrible it is. So you have to make sure you use your stuff yourself. This right here is an example of what we do at Vistacom or what, what you should be doing when you're starting the design or the development of an application. Make a list step by step of what a user uses your application for. That way you can see what are the potential hangups, what are the places that they could get tripped up, what are the places that they could stumble or get confused, or, or what are the places that we need to make this application very easy to use so we can keep them on the site for as long as possible. Because you guys are internet users, you know the first time you have to think at a website, the first time that you have to decide what you need to do or you need to search or look, you just hit back and Google. Right? Unless a website, the new, the new study just released yesterday, I haven't even put this in my, uh, my, my slides yet, is a user decides whether or not they like a website within 500 milliseconds. So fast stuff hasn't even loaded yet. And so it's very important to make sure that your application is easy to use. The third part is that it, makes, it changes the way that they spread your application. And, and really what that means is the best marketing is, the free, is free marketing. If you look here, this, is, this works, right? If you go up to, I mean, it could work. That's way better, way better. If there are any girls in the room, you can confirm that. So it's important that they spread, your users have a positive, uh, a positive opinion of your, your application so they can spread it. This is a really good example, Apple versus Walgreens. I, I gotta say that I don't use any Apple products. I, I have a, a Windows 8 laptop, a Windows 7 laptop, um, an Android phone running a version of Android that I compiled myself, and a Motorola Zoom running Linux. So I don't have Android or any Apple devices, but I think that normally if you're gonna talk about the best designed devices um, and the best designed user interfaces from a user experience standpoint, Apple takes that cake. And so I'm gonna use them a lot in this talk. But really, if you look at uh, one specific Apple product versus one specific Walgreens product, the tables have actually turned. Um, Walgreens sees about 30% of the refills for requests for, for their prescriptions come in through the mobile app that they've designed. They've made it simple. You open up the app, you scan the barcode on your, uh, on your bottle, and in an hour you go to your chosen Walgreens and pick up your, um, your, your prescription. It's very easy. People love it. And not only are they driving a lot of traffic through their app, which means they're not taking phone calls, they're not using uh, pharmacist time. What that also means is that people love uh, using Walgreens, because they're just like you. They don't want to talk to somebody either. They just want to be able to and, and then go pick up what they want. Apple, on the other hand, um, made a choice about a month ago, and you guys know what choice I'm talking about, uh, the choice to, to get rid of Google Maps in, in favor of iOS Maps. And uh, it wasn't really a wise choice. It, it was a decision that they made um, for obvious political reasons, and it didn't quite work out. Um, yeah, it's not great. <laughs> And I know really I'm beating a dead horse here, and I apologize for that, but I, I think it's a really good example of, of what you're not supposed to do. Uh, this is actually what the guy would look like if he found the horse using uh, iOS maps. <sighs> yeah, let's continue. Here's the truth. A well-designed application can mean the difference between success and failure when it comes uh, to your business model, um, your application, uh, the user experience, et cetera. So design is very important. So let's get into some tips. Here are my tips um, for developers. Having been a designer and a developer, I've, I've been working on the web since my first site launched in March of 1995. And so uh, I've been doing it basically since the beginning. Uh, there, there, were, there were image tags, there were uh, links, and there was text when I got started in web development. So there wasn't a whole lot to work with. But uh, so I, I've learned some things along the way, and, and I want to share those with you today. First tip, use a consistent layout. It's so important that when you're creating an application or a website, that the spacing is even, that things are lined up properly, um, then they don't look out of place. Because a user, uh, their mind will subconsciously start to navigate through an application or a website user interface before they even consciously look at, and at what they're looking at and start reading. So the moment that you um, sort of mess with their subconscious flow, you start messing with their conscious flow. And that means they have to think harder and they'll leave. I use uh, something for websites called a grid system. Have you guys ever heard of the 960 grid system? 
It, it, for a long time, it was very good. Later, I'm going to get into a little bit of responsive web design and, and, and talk about how that's not really uh, the right way to do it anymore. But this is a really good example of um, a really nice grid system at work. They've broken it down uh, into a, a 12 columns, and then or one column and then three columns. This is a 12, uh, 12 column layout or 12 column grid system. And they've done a really, really good job laying this website out nicely. This is another really good example. They go from one column to three columns to four columns. And even though the number of columns changes as you move down the website, your eye never gets confused. Your brain never is like, wait, wait, why is that there? Why is that lined up the way it's lined up? And the reason is, is because they've adhered to that grid system. This right here, Panoa Tech, I, I use this one. I've never actually heard of this company before, but I found this website example. And I think that this is one of the most complex grid layouts I've ever seen. And yet they've done it beautifully because it adheres to a simple column and grid layout. They start with one column and they move to three and then to four and then to six and then back to one. And the whole time your eye and your brain knows exactly where it's going because it's laid out so evenly and cleanly. And that's just as simple as pulling up a grid layout, evenly dividing the page and laying things out in those columns. And so stay tuned for a little later tonight um, where there's more grid talk coming. All right, the second tip, and this one is equally important. And this one I think that I should really emphasize, especially here if you guys are developers, because this is one that, that in my experience, developers trip on the most, and that's use white space. Uh, most of the developers that I know, they try and jam as much stuff into every screen as possible, because your minds as developers, you're the top 1%, right? You are the power users of the power users group when it comes to computers. So if there's 100 things on a page, that's perfectly okay with you. Your mind knows what that text box does in the, it does in the background, and, and so you understand exactly how to use an application that's jam tight. The normal public, the typical public, if you put too much on a page, if you put too much on a screen, if you mess with their flow by not separating things using white space, they just won't use the application. And so it's real easy. Just use less white space between uh, items in a group so you can say that there's a logical uh, correlation between these items. Use more white space to separate groups of items to so cause a logical separation there. This is a good example. Yikes. This is actually a form that was handed to me about a year ago. It was already coded. It was finished. The client had seen it and approved it. And we were, <laughs> all right, I said, that's fine. Um, why don't I just take a look at it and, and maybe make some changes? That's what it ended up as. Do you see the difference? Easier to read, easier to use, and there's white space making a distinction between parts. And so when the client saw this, he, he was a developer himself, but he loved it because he, he had said to someone, uh, but didn't say to us, I don't think anybody's going to fill that form out. It's just too complicated. This form, after we were done with it, had the same number of text boxes, and they saw a 30% increase in conversions just by simply changing the way that it's laid out. All right. So it, the, another thing that white space does if you use it correctly, is it greatly increases the ability of the user to read what you're, you're putting on the screen and comprehend what's going on. Have you guys ever used the pocket or read it later? Uh, no, you guys aren't users? I love, I love this, I love this. They do a great job in their user interface of logically separating articles. Because of the white space and because of the difference in size of the text, you can tell each article. There's no question in your brain. You don't even have to read the title. You don't have to read the text at all. You just know by looking at that exactly what each of those items are. You know that there's a logical separation between them because of the white space. The next tip, this one's a hard one for, for uh, a lot of developers I know too, is to use color, size, and positioning to convey importance. What's the most important thing in this picture? If you had to guess, what would you say is the most important thing in that picture? The big red dot, right? It's obvious. It's easy. It's bright, it's big, and it's separated from everything else. So it's easy to tell what the most important there. What's the most important part of this picture? Any guesses? Yellow dot. Okay. Anybody else? Blue square. The blue square. Anybody else? There 
there you go. How's that? The problem with this particular layout is that there were three separate guesses and all three of them could have been right. And so what that means is just because the way this page has been laid out, we've confused the user. And that's a problem. Users don't want to think. They're lazy. Again, look at this sample. From the very beginning, you can see that there's a color and a white space and a size separation between each individual section of the form. While the number of fields were the same, because we have, according to the user's brain, given some more importance than others, there's a logical flow, and it's easy for them to fill out this form. Here's a block of text. <clears throat> this is, if, if you weren't around in 1995, this is what the internet looked like in 1995. <laughs> this, is, this is it right here. You had time, well, it, except it was Times New Roman font, and it was a white background, but this is what the internet looked like in 1995. Unfortunately, for a user, there's no logical separation between what's important and what isn't, what's a paragraph, what isn't, and the readability and the retainability of this particular block of text would be zero. And that's separate from the fact that it's in lorem ipsum. Here we've separated out the subtitles of each individual section, but really still it's just a block of text. There's really no way to look at this text and realize, hey, I know how, what's important, I know what's not. There's no way to skim that either. By doing this, we've just we've boldened the, the, the title text and we've, we've made it larger so there's beginning to be a separation between what's important and what isn't here, but yet that you can still do a little bit better. By simply adding a little bit of white space, uh, changing the font of the titles, we've very clearly told the user, if you need to skim, if you're looking for one piece of information, and it, only one piece of information, and you don't have to read the whole page, you can simply look for the title or the heading that you think that piece of information would, would be under. As a, what would we do? We'd control F, right? And we'd, we'd do a search for the words that we're looking for on a page. Um, there was a study done, 12% of users know what control F is in a browser. So it's, it's important for us to, as designers and as developers to help separate that information. I think that this is one of the greatest quotes um, I've ever read on the subject. So go ahead and take a second and read it, and then we'll talk about it. The three keywords there are usable, accessible, and logical. As developers, and maybe as anybody a designer in the room, I probably should have asked this from the beginning because I'm just assuming there's one back, yeah. So okay, great, so you're all front-end developers. Any, any .NET developers at all? Hey, so am I, don't feel bad. <laughs> the, world's, the, world, the business world runs on .NET. So, awesome. We won't get into that because we'll get stoned and then thrown out the door. So it's important that when you look at design, don't look at it like a hippie using Photoshop, filters to make things pretty, adding pictures of cats and lens flares and all that jazz. That's not design. That's decoration. Design is finding a way to, to present information in a usable, accessible, and logical way. And you guys are uber logical. That's, that's what you do. You write logic for a living. And so um, just by, by stepping one step beyond that and stop thinking just like a computer but also like a human, you'll, you'll greatly improve your design. Awesome. Here's the next thing. Be consistent. This one, you'd be surprised how hard this is. Pick a font and stay with it. Pick a size and stay with it. Pick a color and stay with it. Use one sans serif font for the body, only one. You can use a second larger different sans serif font or a serif font, block font, whatever you want to use um, for the titles. But assign that to an H1 or an H2 tag and only use those. They were given to us, I believe by God himself, sat on a throne and said, you know what? You guys as web developers use H1 tags. Here is H1 tags. Because it makes it so easy, the tags make it so easy to consistently use styles across an entire site. And in fact, with HTML5, between section and article and aside, it makes it very, very easy and very, um, what's the word am I looking for? It starts with an S. Semantic. Semantic, thank you very much. Uh, it, the flow of content becomes very easy to manage. Remember again, simply using H1 tags and then paragraph tags, we end up looking something like that, which is awesome. Here's what happens when somebody uses three different sans serif fonts. 
Well, at first you're like, that's not a problem, that's easy to read. It's, uh, it's, it's been proven in statistics and studies that it takes between three and five seconds for the human brain to recognize text that's in a new font that they haven't seen before. That means that they've read the entire first sentence and part of the second one before they realize what they're reading because their brain is still trying to shift, still trying to adapt to the new font. And so if you just use a consistent font across all three paragraphs, there's no loss in readability. Let's talk about icons. Icons should only be used to add emphasis to a particular piece of content. They should never be used as a standalone thing because a lot of people don't recognize them, don't understand. Another thing that icons should be is consistent across your entire UI. There's nothing worse than having two icons that mean the same thing in one user interface. I hate that. It drives me crazy. But really who drives crazy is users. They like to be sure what they're clicking on. Uh, another thing is they should adhere to the UI user interface standards. We have, as a development community, identified icons that mean certain things. A, 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 a magnifying glass, for instance, what does that mean? Search, right? How about uh, a gear? Settings or configuration, right? Here's another really good example. What's that big triangle in the center of the app? Play, right? You wouldn't use that for a settings menu, would you? That would be very confusing to a user. And yet, there are a lot of times we do something just that silly. How about the one right to the right of it? Fast forward, right? In, in this case, since um, it's skip track, right? Um, uh, but you can see that it's, it's fairly consistent across. How about these? You may want to guess what these are without reading the text below them. At least these guys gave us some text, right? But if they wouldn't have given us this text, what do you want to guess is, um, let's say, uh, it was the one in the middle, the one that looks like a flag. Markup. News, markup, great. Uh, no, that's web design. That's what that icon means on this website. How about the one right to the right? It's like your configuration icon. You'd say so, but, but the one in the upper right is actually the web development icon. And the one in the bottom is CMS integration which makes absolutely no sense. So unless you would have given the user this text, they would be completely confused. How about the lower left? It's a shopping cart, right? What does shopping cart mean? Buy stuff, right? This one they got right. This, that's their e-commerce tab. That's the icon to go to their e-commerce section. So at least they got that one right. So you can see the power of icons used correctly versus incorrectly. How about this one? This one's actually on a website of a friend of mine. And I gave him a really hard time about this. Drives me nuts. What's that top icon? What do you think that icon goes to? Topics. Upsetting topics, yes. <laughs> That's the icon that says, these are the tears you shed while you're trying to figure out what these icons are. How about the one right below that? Pictures? Pictures, you'd think so. That would be exactly what you would assume, because they look like, no, that's a monitor. Oh, oh right, right, you sort of see that now. How about the one below that? It's a brain, right? That section goes to our expertise. The problem is, is to me, that represents the amount of my brain I need to use to figure out what that icon means. And uh, my brain minus that much is how much brain I have left to think about the content on the site. And how about the fourth one? Stock trending. trending, economics, stock market, right? No, no, that's none of those. That's um, improvements in our business. So as you can see, um, it, it creates some confusion on the user's part. Now here, here's what I find crazy. They've done a great job of explaining these icons because if you hover over them with a mouse, it will sh it, like a, there's a slide out menu that's actually really cool that tells you exactly what each one of these sections are for. But um, who can't see hover over slide out menus? Anybody who's on touch, anybody who uh, is using screen readers, right? They don't see that stuff because at the time, the display on that set to None. Guess, guess what screen readers skip? Things that have display none on them. And so it's not always the greatest idea to get fancy with your icons. If you wanted to show your expertise, right, there's a specific icon for that. If you wanted to show examples, there's an icon for a portfolio, right? And so it's important to use the ones um, that match what you're trying to do. All right, color. Every color that you put on a page is important. 
because the more consistent you are with your colors, the easier it is for a user to navigate through your site. For 90% of this country, color is the number one indicator of action. Red means stop, right? Green means go, or money, or look at this, depending on its context. And so color is very important. I always tell people that every color should ma consistently match an action on your website. If there's one part of your website that has red, that is for click here, this is my call to action, I want to get your attention, look at this really bright red. And uh, that's fine if you want to do that. Uh, there's some psychological problems with that, but let's say you do do that. And then later on in the site, there's a big red bar that's used for something entirely different. That creates confusion in the user, and in the long run, your, your, your uh, conversion rate will be lower. And I want you to remember this too, 10% of the world is at least partially colorblind. That's the other 10% to the 90% that I was talking about before. A lot of times it's blue-green and guys, or, or blue-purple, or, or red-orange. So depending on how you're laying out your colors, uh, you'll end up confusing 10% of the population if you don't also give them some direction some way else. And this is the other part that, that I think is important. Don't reinvent the wheel. I don't know if you guys have ever he heard of the um, Adobe Cooler before. Has anybody ever heard of that? It is, it is the single greatest resource for color on the face of the planet. If you, have, want, you need a color scheme that, that approximately matches the logo or something like that, you just go there and they've got 10,000 color schemes that have been made up by other designers and they've been ranked and they've been rated and so it's very easy to see. I need the top 1,000 with approximately this color and you can see all of the color schemes that people use uh, to match what you need to match it with. And so uh, it makes it very easy to pick out a color scheme. Here's a user interface that I think uses all of it really well. You've got icons, but they use text to help you understand what those icons are for. They, uh, they, they evenly space out, uh, using white space, they space out all of the options, and they use uh, larger, bolder text for the titles of each individual section, and then uh, l darker text, smaller text, to, to describe what's going on there. So that's, that is a really good use of all of the tips we've talked about so far. Okay, next tip. This one's important too. This is actually my pet peeve, and so I put it in here. Use typical casing. Do you see the difference between these two? The human brain sees the drops below and, and the letters above uh, the English language to, to begin to understand what's being written before it actually reads it. And so to do all one case, like, like the second option, really what you're doing is you're confusing your brain. These guys are really guilty of that. Um, I hate that. No one actually likes that, so don't do it. Um, really, they've just made it more difficult to navigate through their user interface. And if you go look on the forums, if you go look um, on their website, if you, if you go look at complaints that are made about the, the new user interface of the new Visual Studio, um, it's very abundantly clear exactly how bad this new user interface is. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Um, and it, it's not uh, testing of people who use the internet, it's testing on human brains in general. And they found a significantly higher um, retention rate if a person, if you're using uh, typical casing versus all caps. Significantly higher, like in the, in the order of magnitude. Um, there was that email going around, I want to say five years ago, about uh, a Harvard study where they took out all the vowels. Do you guys remember reading about that? Um, they took out all the vowels out of a word, and without even thinking about it, the human brain was still able to comprehend what it was reading. Um, that's the same study that, that they discovered this particular um, phenomenon. So, awesome. <laughs> Here's another one I hate. Uh, left aligned stuff. I can't express that enough. Um, too often I see things that are center aligned um, or right aligned, and there are specific purposes to that, right? Center aligned makes it very difficult to read and understand what's going on because what the human brain does is it reaches the end of the line um, of text and it immediately goes back to the far left side, goes down one line and starts reading. Um, the problem is when the left, align or when the left side of, of text isn't aligned properly, what happens is it your brain can't figure out where it needs to go next, and so it goes back and forth and back and forth, and it takes you um, over twice as long to read the same amount of text. So it's very important um, to not do this unless for a specific purpose, like a title or something else that you want to stand out. Right casing is the same. 
If we're from a country uh, such as an Arab country where they use right aligning for their text, their brains would be trained differently than ours. But right align is great if you want to be contrarian, if you want to make a point, if you want to make a title stand out or something like that. But there's nothing worse that you can do for readability than right aligning blocks of text. So don't do that either. All right. And I think that this is one of the most important quotes that I'll ever, I'll ever tell you guys. 99% of creativity is forgetting where you stole your idea from. It's so important to remember that. You're not gonna, you're, there's nothing new under the sun. You're not gonna create something that nobody has ever seen before. So you might as well go somewhere and find inspiration. I do it all the time. As a designer, there are thousands of websites that I can go out and search for. Search for design inspiration. And the, you can go from, from site to site looking at inspiration for uh, dark background websites, light background websites, uh, uh, you, Android and, and iOS user interface examples. And there are actually websites that that's all they do is come up with, with examples. Here's a, a really good example of, of a classic ripoff that, uh, that a lot of people don't realize. There is not a thing that Apple has done since Johnny Ives have taken over the design work there that isn't based on another product. On the left, you have um, a monitor from, that was created. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't a, like a computer monitor. It was a, uh, how do you describe it? It was like a stock ticker monitor that, that uh, Dieter Rams designed for Braun in 1962. On the right is, is a uh, iMac. Here's another example. On the left is a Braun product. On the right is a Mac Pro. How about this one? I don't know if you could get any more blatant than that. So as you can see, a Apple doesn't do anything new. They, they take inspiration from past classics. How about this one? All right, you can get more blatant than the past one, this particular one. It's a great job of adapting a design that already exists um, to meet the, day, the modern day user's needs. And here's a question I always ask people. Do you copy and paste code? When was the last time you went out to Stack Exchange and searched for a problem and the solution was eight lines of JavaScript, and rather than typing it all in or coming up with your own way to run that for loop, you just decided, I'm, you know, I'm going to copy and paste this code and change the variable names and call it good, right? It's the same thing. Being a developer is just as creative as being a designer, and sometimes you have to look at what other people are doing to find a better way of doing it than what you've come up with. So don't feel bad about that. All right, next tip. <laughs> Navigation. It must be easy. You have to remember that it's so important to say that users will not think, they will not work, they will simply look at something and if they can't figure it out right away, they'll leave your site. So always use proper nesting. Always use breadcrumb navigation if you've got the space on a page. It's so nice for a user to be able to see where they've come from or where they are on a site. Always remember to consider touch. There's nothing I hate worse than people who use really nice flyout menus, but when you touch them, they go somewhere because the top level of navigation is a link. There needs to be a way to open that particular navigation item. And so always use the top one as a button to click and open. So always consider touch when you're considering UI design. Next, <laughs> I can't express this enough. Keep it simple. Don't make your users think. Users don't want to think, and they're not going to think. And so just make it as easy as possible to, to navigate your site or your app, whatever you're using. This is a hot dog. How many of you guys like hot dogs? I love hot dogs. I can eat hot dogs all day long. You know what my favorite part about a hot dog is? It's easy. Put it in the microwave, I can throw it in a pot of boiling water, I can throw it on the grill, and I can put it on a bun and I need it, right? But what's nice about a hot dog is you don't look at a hot dog and think to yourself, how am I gonna eat this hot dog today? Am I gonna eat it from the bottom? Am I gonna eat it from the top? You sit there and you look at it like this, what end am I going to approach this hot dog from today? Because if I approach it from this direction, it might be different than I approach it from this direction. That's not how you think about a hot dog. It's just a hot dog and you just eat it. That's a hot dog. That website right there is a hot dog. It's easy to use. You don't got to think about it. You don't got to wonder what you're going to do. You don't got to worry that what you're going to do is incorrect or you're going to get lost or you're not going to find what you're looking for. That's not a hot dog. <laughs> do you see the difference? Guess which one is more popular? Google. And it's not because they're better. If you've seen those Bing commercials, right? Two thirds of the people like the research results of Bing better. Those are the same search results as Bing. The problem is, it's not easy, and so people don't use it. They get lost, and that's the number one complaint about Yahoo. Still to this day, it's not easy to use. It's too confusing. There's too much stuff on the page. That's a hot dog. That's a mess. That's a mess. This is an app that I found on the, on the internet 
They called this their simple redesign. All this does is change file formats and size of images. Couldn't be more simple. You need like two text boxes and a click. And you should be able to do everything you need to do. Instead, there's all of this. That, that company doesn't exist anymore, not surprisingly. I owned this phone. Anybody else own this phone? Samsung SCHI 760, Windows Phone. It was awesome. It was great. It, it should have been the most popular phone in the history of smartphones. The problem was is it came out a week after that phone. Do you see the difference there? Huh? That's a hot dog. That's not a hot dog. <laughs> and so people bought that in droves because it was easy. That's my daughter. She's one and a half years old. You can hand her an iPad in a closed case. She can open the case, turn on the iPad, unlock it, open up the game she wants to play and play the game. She's a year and a half old. That's a successful user interface design. I'm an Android guy. I love Android. It's complicated. There's a reason why people say, people you know, who work with, with people with autism or other mental disabilities, they use iPads to communicate with them because they're easy and anybody can do it. That's a successful UI design. When a one and a half year old sits down at your application and can, can cor you know, correctly navigate it and use it the way it should be used, you've done a good job designing your user interface. And I'm not talking about literally a one and a half year old. I have to make this distinction. What I'm saying is when the dumbest person in the trade group or the user group that's going to be using your application can properly use it, you've successfully made an application. Now, I understand that there are applications that are made for engineers. Right? I understand that there are applications that are made for doctors, but there are dumb engineers. And sadly, there are dumb doctors. And when they can use your app, you've been successful. Let's talk about some quick hits. Make every action item on the page obvious. Everybody should know that that's a link. Everybody should know that that's a button that you click. Make the important items stand out. Bold them, underline them, change their color, you know, wrap them in a big black box with lots of white space around them. Minimize the noise. If you don't need it there, don't put it there. Goes to this, omit every needless item. If you can't come up with an explicit reason why something's on the page, it shouldn't be there. This is Dieter Ram's quote when he was talking about his design philosophy at Braun in the 1960s. Every Apple design is based on his stuff, and he said the reduction to the essential has never led to catastrophe. The more stuff you add, the more difficult it is to use, and the more likely it is to fail. Here's a, here is what I call the scale of interaction. If it's simple, people will click it. If it requires thought, they'll start thinking, is that a button? Do I, is that what I want? Is that something that I want to click on? Uh, there's a law. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it before. It's a mathematical law, but it applies really well to design. Hicks law. It says this. There's an inverse relationship between the number of choices you give a user and the time it takes them to decide. So as you reduce their choices, it reduces the amount of time it takes for them to make a decision. As you increase their choices, it increases the amount of time that it takes for them to make a decision. And there's a breaking point at which point, no matter what you do, the, the user will never make a decision. Paralysis by choice. Finally, I always tell people this. When in doubt, leave it out. If it's not important, don't put it there. All right. <laughs> Keep your instructions simple. There, uh, about 12 years ago, if I remember right, on the ballot for the President of the United States, there was a four paragraph explanation of what you were supposed to do. Only pick one, only choose one, don't choose two. If you choose two, then we are going to disregard your ballot. Blah, 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 blah. And it ended up being four paragraphs long. The next four years later, they redesigned that ballot, and there was one sentence of instructions choose one. And the, the amount of bad ballots that they had went down by 80%. People understood those instructions because they kept them simple. Finally, test, test, test. It's so important when you are designing an interface to test it and test it again and test it again. An A-B test, change the color, change the font size, move things around on the page. Find the, the, way, the layout that works best for your users because it's not you that's important. It's the people who are using your application. Jared Spool said this. In the last six weeks, have your team members spent at least two hours watching people experience your product or service? That's a powerful question, and I can almost guarantee everybody here in the room the answer to that question is no. It was for us for a long time at Vistacom. 
We created our own uh, content management system. We have a very specific clientele that required a very specific set of functionality. And so we, we wrote our own CMS. Um, and at, at one point, about a year ago, it had gotten completely out of control. There were, I think, 40 or 50 modules for it, 30 or 40 different plugins. Nobody knew what everything did, and it was a mess. Even the users themselves thought it was a mess, but they just never told us. So what we started doing is watching the users use it. And we very quickly realized that even though it did what we wanted it to do, nobody could make it do it. And so we had to simplify things. And after that, our users were far happier. And all it took was about five hours of observation to realize that we had a problem. And then it took a couple of weeks to fix that problem. But we have much happier customers now simply because we took the time to watch them use their product, our product. This is what I say, people. Don't ask if your application can do what it should. Ask if your users can make it do what it should because there's a very big difference there. You guys can do it because you wrote the code. You know what function gets called when you press that button. Unfortunately, your users don't. And so they're the ones that end up confused. Any questions? All right. Well, awesome. That's what I was hoping.